Hey, 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 welcome Motion Church. Hey, can we do this? Let's throw a great big uh, a love fest to our South Hill campus from down here in the valley. Just mwah, love you guys. We also want to welcome all those that are watching online literally all over the world tonight. Glad you dialed in on motionchurch.com. Uh, we know that it is a sunny Saturday night. We know the car show is going on downtown. We know that there's a lot of reasons why people are just checked out on vacation because it's legitimate. you got to recreate to recreate. But aren't you glad you're here tonight in God's house? I believe this, that God is ready and willing and able to turn your mourning into dancing, to turn your weeping into laughter, to turn your pain into healing. And all you have to do is just simply say yes. And so uh, tonight we're in for a great treat. My good friend Shane Baxter is here from Melbourne, Australia. Now, let me tell you about this dude. Uh, you're going to love this on South Hill because this guy, he kind of reaches through the camera and gets you in the heart. Uh, Shane and Georgie pastor the Enjoy Network in uh, Melbourne, Australia. 14 different sites all throughout their, their grasp of influence. And, and they are just an apostolic, that means uh, leadership training, developing, gospel carrying kind of people. They have this apostolic gift on them that you would think like they're like these dignitaries that are like in the green room behind the curtain. No one touches them. Not true. Shane Baxter is kind of like Crocodile Dundee. If you've ever seen the movie. Uh, there's, a, there's this term called bogan in Australia. Now bogan is kind of like a redneck out there uh, shirt cut off at the sleeves kind of straw hat. Straw in his mouth, kind of guy, you would never mess with him if he didn't know Jesus because you'd be afraid. But here's what's crazy the brother found the Lord and turned that craziness into godliness. And everywhere he goes now, people love him. And he just relates to people. He rides Harleys for heaven's sake, he has muscle cars in his garage. And he loves Australian rules football. And you know what he loves? The United States of America. No, straight up, whenever he comes here, here's what he does. God bless America. God bless America. And his wife, Georgie, uh, is, is the better end of the couple. I mean, she's at the top of the food chain. She, the woman preaches, she teaches, she leads, and she's an amazing uh, minister in her own right. So here's what I'd like us to do. At our South Hill campus and here at our downtown, can you please stand to your feet right now? Can you put your hands together and welcome my very, very good friend, Pastor Shane Baxter. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Hey, how you doing? Are you good? What are you doing sitting down? Don't sit down yet. If you're good, why don't you give God some praise right about now? Come on. We're in church so we can praise the Lord. We can do a bit more. Come on. Praise God. It is good to be in church on Saturday night. Everybody said? I don't know about you. I think it's great to be in church Saturday night. I'm not just here because I'm here. I'm here because I want to be here. Anyone here because you want to be here? How many of you got dragged along? Don't raise your hand. All right. But how many of you know if you're a husband at times that will happen? Maybe if you're a wife at times, if you're a kid, it's going to happen. But then there's a point where you can get to that place where it's like, I want to be in church tonight. If you're here, why don't you give God praise one more time? Praise God. Come on. We, one more time. Praise God. You can take a seat. It is so good to be out Saturday night. To Pastor Roger and Tina Archer, we love you guys. It is so, so good to be here. I feel like every time we come back, something new and exciting is happening. And obviously, we've got new property. We're going to build a new building. We're going to continue to change the world. There's online things happening. There's Apple things happening. There's all sorts of things happening. And it is so good to be here. So Pastor Roger and Tina and all of your family, I feel like we've got nieces and nephews now in America. And uh, it is just so good to be here. We love you. Enjoy love you, you know that every time you come to enjoy. We went to the, we went to the Aussie Open this year uh, when you guys were down, and it was so much fun. Pastor Roger wanted to be a ball boy, but I couldn't organize it, you know what I'm saying? Could you imagine Pastor Roger as a ball boy at the tennis? It would be awesome. We could do it together. You could have one side of the net, I could have the other side. Man, it could be crazy in there. How, how many of you know he is a little bit crazy in the right sort of way? And uh, he's, that's why he's changing the world. You've got to be a little bit crazy. How many of you would agree with that? I went to the Good Guys Car Show today. I've got to tell you, praise God. Uh, God bless America, all right. God, here's the thing. You know what I love most about the car show? wasn't the cars. 
I love the cars. I, I, I'm a car guy. I love cars. It wasn't the cars at about 12 o'clock today. Uh, someone came across the, the sound system and, and, and said, going to introduce you to someone. That I, we couldn't see him, but we're going to introduce you to someone. And, and she's got Down syndrome and da-da-da-da. And then she began to sing the national anthem. At that point in time, everyone, like thousands of people, just stop in their, their stop. And they put their hand over their heart. And I've got to tell you, I shed a tear right there. As in, I'm not American, but I feel like I'm American. And uh, to God... Amen. God bless America. And can I encourage you? You are in the greatest, well, if it's not the greatest nation, it's it. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to say praise God for America. It's, uh, you know, we, we've been, you guys have been to war. We've been to war with you for many, many years, many, many times. And uh, I just love the relationship between our nation and your nation. And it is just a joy to be here tonight. I want to send a big cheerio to South Campus. Where am I? South Hill, right here. Right there. We're looking at the red light. So I want to send a big cheerio to South Hill tonight and also the online team. And bring greetings from Enjoy Church. Praise God. How many of you know it's better to enjoy church than endure church? How many of you, when you were in another church, endured church? You know what I'm saying? Not this church, of course. When I was a kid, I used to endure church. Then I got saved, and I'm like, man, I want to enjoy church. You know what I'm saying? As in, I don't want to go to church sucks. I want to enjoy church. And, uh, and so I bring greetings this morning. So there, there, Sunday morning there, so I say this morning, because I'm in two places at the moment. I'm here Saturday night, but it's also Sunday morning there. So they're having their services, and they send their, their greetings, and here we go. How many of you are ready for the word? Want the word? Uh, that was okay. How many of you are ready for the word? Yeah. All right. All right. It's all right. So, so if you know me, you know that I'm okay for you to yell at me, all right? Uh, you can shout me down. You can throw shoes at me, cash at me, pizza at me. I'll take it all, you know what I'm saying? So you just feel, fr you feel free. We've got over 100 nationalities in our West Campus, which is where I'm at. This is one, that's where we've been for the last 20 years. And I've got to tell you, some of those people know how to get rowdy in the house of God. So you feel free to take it wherever you want to go. Psalm chapter 30, reading verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. What comes in the morning? Joy. What comes in the morning? Joy. Weeping may endure for a night, uh, a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, I don't know about you, I love this verse. Anybody else love this verse? I love the verse. I'm into the verse. I get the verse, but, but, but how many of you have realized for many the sun's not coming up? <laughs> Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, but for many the sun's not coming up. The sun's not coming up in their own life. The sun's not coming up in their marriages or in their families. For many, the sun is not coming up. It was reported recently in Australia that, that uh, one in eight people in Australia are on antidepressants. How many of you know that's like, that, 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 is, that is like too many. Three million Australians are on antidepressants. One in eight. The number in America is one in nine. How many of you know that same, same, but different? At the end of the day, we're really talking about the same thing. So for many, the night continues on and, and is holding people in a place of darkness and weeping and distress and depression. So while in the beginning, we're believing the sun is going to come up. When I was a young fella, young fella, how many of you know what a young fella is? That was like last century, for those of you who don't know. When I was a young fella, I used to go shooting with my dad. We'd get up at 4 a.m. and uh, we'd drive out 40, 50 minutes and we'd find ourselves on a property and we would wait for the sun to come up. You know, we'd sit there, sit there, sit there, and eventually the sun would come up. But, but I got to tell you, I'd hate to think what it would be like if I was in a marriage or in a family or in a business or in a, and I'm, I'm tr or in a life that there is no sun coming up. How many of you know God wants your sun to come up? How many of you know Jesus wants to rise in your situation? He wants the sun to rise again. So, so while we believe in the beginning that we're, and we're looking for the sun to break through, how many of you know it says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so when the sun never comes up, how many of you know we go to a place in our own hearts where it's like we get ourselves sick? So as we go here today, please understand that, that as I speak about these things, I'm not a physician like Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. I'm not a, I'm not a physician. I'm simply a humble carpenter, much like our Lord and Savior. <laughs> That's all I got. I'm not a physician. I'm a chippy. I'm a carpenter like our Lord. 
I'm a carpenter who was radically saved 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, 32 years ago. They wheeled me into a hospital cubicle with alcoholic poisoning. I was out of my brain. I was unconscious. And in that place, I encountered Jesus for myself. How many of you know one encounter with Jesus can change the rest of your life? 32 years, they wheeled me in. So now here I am living for Jesus for the last 32 years. I've been married to the same beautiful bride for over 30 years, praise God. She's the ooh-la-la of my life. You know what I'm talking about. You know, don't look at her like that. She's my la la You know what I'm saying? And it's like, oh, my Lord. I tell people all the time, we've been married over 30 years, the best 30 years of Georgie's life, but whatever. I'll move on from that. I got, I got two beautiful daughters. I got a Japanese son-in-law. You know what I'm saying? Karate Kid. I got to love Karate Kid. When, when Rio came to Australia, he'd never seen the Karate Kid. I said, you're not really Japanese. You know what I'm saying? I got two ugly dogs. Praise God for ugly dogs. How many of you know uh, dogs are meant to be ugly? You don't want a dog that looks beautiful. You want an ugly dog. How do you tell how, how ugly a dog is? It should look the same when it runs to you as it's running away from you. That's what you want in a dog. They, they look good. They smell bad. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's an ugly dog. I got a cat, but I don't even know why I put it in there because who cares about cats? You know what I'm saying? So, but whatever. So, so, and now, now I get to lead this incredible church called Enjoy Church. I got to tell you, one of the greatest churches on the planet, which, which connects me to the most beautiful people on the planet. Amen. And so here I find myself now. I'm the original, original enjoyer. I'm an international fun monkey. There's no doubt about that. Known for my passion, my faith, my humor. But if I could be really honest, a few months ago, I'd realized that if I was just going to be honest, that I'd lost my joy. And so I, not all the time, and not in every situation, but in many areas of my life, I'd lost my joy. And it's like, I, I know what we preach, and I know what we teach, and I'm, I'm the fun monkey, you know what I'm saying? It's like, how many of you know it's, it's no fun when the fun monkey loses his joy? It's not meant to be like that, but just being honest, I'd lost my joy. I, I was feeling weighed down. I was feeling like I was carrying around a weight that was suffocating me. I'd be in meetings like we do meetings, and because how many of you know th these aren't the only meetings we do each week? We actually work from Monday to Saturday, or whatever the case may be. We're in other meetings, and and I find my, I found myself I didn't even want to be there. I'm looking around at my team, who I love to bits, and I know they love me to bits, and I'm like, Aah. you know what I'm saying? I just did not want to be there. And then I'd be driving down the road, and someone would be ringing, who who who's like good people ringing me, and I'm looking at their number, and I'm like, oh, whatever. Just turn it over, I'll not answer it. I'd be, I'd be getting asked uh, questions by Georgie and team members about decisions that had to be made. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to make the decision. If I could be really honest, I'd lost my joy. Now, theologically, we know the thief came to what? Steal. Amen. That's right. Steal, kill, and destroy. Friends, I'm here to tell someone tonight that if you're feeling depressed, maybe you're on the South Hill tonight, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling oppressed, weighed down, distressed, as though your joy is being suffocated or stolen, can I say to you today, joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. This, this is not just for leaders. This is not just for pastors. This is for every man of God, every woman of God, every child of God. Joy comes in the morning. And if you're feeling like, yeah, you're speaking to me, then can I encourage you today to get up and get on the front foot and get yourself back into the game. Now, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the joy of the Lord is our strength in life. In love, praise God. How many of you know if you're married, you need the joy of the Lord? I mean, Georgie does. <laughs> she has to put up with me. All right. How many of you know if you're going to be in a family, you're going to need the joy of the Lord? So the joy of the Lord is our strength in life, in love, in leadership, in marriage, in families, in relationships, in work, in ministry. So that being said, what do you think it is that the enemy wants to steal from you the most? If the joy is your strength, what's the enemy going to come after? He's going to come after your joy, your joy. And how does he do that? How does he go about stealing our joy? Well, let's start with the verse that we've already read, Nehemiah 8 verse 10. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, we know there's a time to grieve, but you know what I see? I see so many people that get stuck in their grief. We're not meant to get stuck in the grief. How many of you know you've actually got a choice as to how long you're going to grieve? 
Uh, uh, so we live in, we live in a very multi, uh, national, multicultural community. And, and there's a lot of nationalities that are now living in Australia where they will wear clothing that is signaling, signaling, signaling to the world that they are grieving. They may have lost someone in the 70s and they're still wearing black today. And I was like, are you for real? Absolutely. They're not going to change their clothes basically until they die because that's a sign that I'm going to continue to grieve. Friends, can I encourage you today because maybe you've come in today and I don't know your situations, but maybe you're going through a scenario, a situation, and you find yourself grieving. There is a time to grieve, but then there's a time to say, now the joy of the Lord is going to be my strength again. Can I encourage you, do not elevate uh, grief over your joy because you can't have these two things living together. As long as you choose to elevate grief in your life, now I know that it's it's going to get hard here, but as long as you choose to elevate grief, joy is going to have to take a back seat. But when you say to grief, we're not going to do this anymore, and at that point in time, you're inviting joy to come to the front. So grief will steal your joy. You've got to make a choice. I'm not going to grieve for the rest of my life over that situation. I found myself grieving over a muscle car. True story. Uh, now, some of you are like, I feel your pain. How many, how many brothers in the house remember a car that they sold, and they're like, why did I sell that car? Four years ago, I sold an XAGT. There was only 891 XAGTs made. I sold my XAGT for $85,000. You should be like, you should be praising the Lord. Today, it's worth 160. Uh, it's like art. It's like art. I was grieving because I, was th- I wasn't grieving about the car. I was grieving because I was thinking about my children and their inheritance. I want to be able to help my children buy houses. I want to be able to do things for them. I want to be a blessing to my children and my children's children. i got to tell you, this spirit of grief got in. It plagued me to the point where I found myself apologizing to Georgie over and over for being stupid and selling the car. I sold the car because essentially it was about what would the church think about me having a car like this? So I sold it. Boom, kick myself in the backside again. Stop grieving, Shane. Get on with it. All right. I had to make a decision, though. I'm not going to grieve any longer. What else will steal your joy? Comparison. Comparison will steal your joy. How many of you know uh, social media is, is wonderful and it's ugly? U-G-L-Y. You ain't got no alibi. You ugly. How many of you know? But on social media, everyone's beautiful. Everyone is better looking. Everyone's got better girlfriends. Friends, that's right. Everything's better, whatever. And it's like, how many of you know it's all better on social media? And I've said to some of my pastor friends, the best at lying on social media are pastors. Praise God. We know how to do it the best. Like, like if, I, if I was to do it today, I'd be taking a photo right here of that section right there, and I would post that church was full on Saturday night. You know what I'm saying? Because we just, yeah, you know what I'm saying? As in, I never knew my life sucked until I got Instagram. You know what I'm saying? But then I got Instagram and I realized, Shane, you are a loser. You know what I'm saying? Loser, man. You're not doing anything with your life. How many of you know unforgiveness will steal your joy? Unforgiveness is going to steal your joy. My, my father, my father, man, he had, my, my dad is now 76. So I'd reckon until he was probably 65, 77. So probably until he's 65, he had real issues with his stepdad. When he was adopted as a 15-year-old, his stepfather would not give him the surname Baxter, but he said, if you want it, you can go to Depot and buy it for 10 shillings. All right, back in the day. So my dad had to buy the surname Baxter, which really messed with his identity. I would say to my dad all the time, Dad, you don't, it's the man who makes the name, not the name who makes the man. And you've got to find who you are in Christ. And it's like, but I was like, Dad, you've got to let this thing go. And Dad is like, Dad would be like, well, when he asks for forgiveness, I'll let him go. I said, the dude's dead. <laughs> he, he died. <laughs> it's like, how can he ask for, you got to let it go. And there's a song there, I'm sure you would sing it. Uh, you got to let it go. And some of you got things in your heart, let it go. Don't let unforgiveness steal your joy. What about jealousy? Jealousy. How many of you know jealousy will steal your joy? How many of you have ever been going to a wedding and you bought a new dress? Praise God. You know what I'm saying? You buy the new dress and you walk in and you think, have a look at me, I'm looking fantastic. And you do look fantastic. But then someone else walks in with that same dress and they've got the shoes to match. You didn't get the shoes. 
you were feeling great about yourself until you saw their shoes and it's like, I hate her because of jealousy. How many of you know jealousy leads to bitterness? Your joy is gone. What about overstretching? Overstretching will steal your joy. When you overstretch financially, when you overstretch with work, when you overstretch uh, with commitments, you get too busy. How many of you know it's going to steal your joy? Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6 says, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Now, we can go on all night about the things that are going to steal our joy, the joy robbers, but I don't want to take too much time there because I want to speak about breaking the spirit of heaviness off you. That's what I found myself under, a spirit of heaviness. And I was like, I I was just bound down by this thing because this is what happens when joy moves out, heaviness moves in. All right, when joy moves out, heaviness moves in. Now, now, now we're no longer on our toes. I don't know about you, I live on my toes. You live on your toes, you're crazy. Uh, but I live on my toes. How many of you remember the Flintstones? You remember when Fred would bowl? You know what I'm saying? How many of you remember that part? And then bang, off it goes. And it's like, that's how I live. That's how I've always lived. But when this happens, when you become heavy, we're no longer on our toes, we're no longer quick to laugh. Ha, I laugh at you. How many of you know Philistines are coming, Goliath is coming, and we pull back, we shrink back. We're no longer full of faith, we're no longer full of optimism. Our joy is gone, and so is our strength. Now now we're weighed down. We're quick to snarl, quick to bark, quick to bite. Sorry, Georgie. Everything becomes dark, dark. My life, my wife, my family, my future are all dark. Everything is heavy because now I'm looking through heavy eyes. Now uh, the bright eyes are gone when I got saved. Everything was, everything was bright. My future was so bright I had to wear shades. You know what I'm saying? But now I just want to give everyone the stink eye because everything in here is stinking. So now I'm looking through stink eyes and everything is bad and everything is negative. Friends, I'm here to tell you today that you feel like that tonight. Joy comes in the morning. South Hill, if you're there and you're thinking this is your life, joy comes in the morning. This is, how, this is the truth. This is Scripture. How many of you could do with some more joy in your life, just out of curiosity? All right, all right, all right. Now, I've been looking at all of you, so I can tell which ones. All right. How many of you could do with some more joy? <laughs> I, could just, I, could, I, I need buckets of it. I need buckets of it. Now, now let's just go here. We, we, we want more joy. Psalm chapter 45, verse 7 says, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. With the oil of joy. I, I, I love this scripture because you love righteousness and hate wickedness. And therefore, they're speaking about you. How many of you, how many of you are here today and you love righteousness and hate wickedness? Give me a wave, that's you. All right. So therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you, by anointing you. South Hill, by anointing you with the oil of joy. The oil of joy. So we come to Christ and we receive the joy of the Lord. We're anointed with the oil of joy. But then because of our grief and because of our comparisons and because of our unforgiveness, jealousy, overstretching, working and commitments, not to mention the sin that so easily entangles us, then heaviness begins to move in. Joy is on its way out and heaviness is moving in. So we can do one of two things at this point. We we can say, well, this is it. This is our lot in life. Stress, distress, oppression, depression. This is my lot. Or we can say, no more, and actually get ourselves back into the game. Get ourselves back on the front foot. Now, remember when Jesus came out of the wilderness. How many of you know, if he came out of the wilderness, before he came out of the wilderness, he actually went into the wilderness? (laughs) There's a thought. How many of you know that's that's it, though? He chose to go in. He knew what he was getting himself into here. He chose to go in, and he, he's in there for a 40-day fast, and he's going through all sorts of testing and tempting and trials, and he's going through it all. After 40 days, he's on his way back out. The Bible says that he went into the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit, but he comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know about you. I don't just want to be full of the Holy Spirit but I actually want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. He made a choice to go in that he might come out. He chose to go down that he might go up. 
Friends, there comes a time in all of our life where we, we need to make some decisions, we need to make some choices to be pressing into the presence of God. The presence of God. I remember in 1998, January, February 1998, I went on a 40-day fast. Now, I like food, you can tell. <laughs> food likes me. We're friends, all right, all right. The Bible says two can't walk together unless they be in agreement. We're in agreement. Me and food, we're good, all right. So, so but we went on a 40-day, oh, I went on a 40-day fast. How many of you have ever been on a 40-day fast? Just a, as in, did you lose your mind at about day 30 or what? I, I was gone. I, <laughs> I was gone. After at day 30, Georgie walks into the uh, came, she came home. I heard her car pull up. I should have stopped, but it was a little embarrassing. She walks in, and I got her cookbook in the kitchen. I'm going, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and she's like, she walks in. She looks at me with like a disgusting look on her face. Says, Shane, what are you doing? I said, I'm licking the chicken. <laughs> and I said, uh, because I like chicken. How many of you like chicken? I promise you, you lick that page enough, you can taste the chicken. You can taste the chicken, it's true. I actually think when we get to heaven, there's going to be three-legged chickens in heaven. Three-legged, extra drumstick for everybody, you know what I'm saying? I, I like chicken, I, I'm partial to chicken. Anyway, moving right along. It's, uh, so Jesus, Jesus goes into the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. Then he comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And where does he go? How many of you know? Uh, if, if I'd have been the Lord, I would have went straight to Anthem for a latte. You know what I'm saying? Just me. But he doesn't. Where does he go? He goes to the temple and he says, he says, I'd like it. Can you give me a scroll? Pass me a scroll. And they said, a coffee scroll. Because No, not a coffee scroll. Can you pass me a, a scroll? And they're like, would you like a psalm? No, I don't want a psalm. I'm not looking for a psalm. Would you, would you like a proverb? No, 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 no. I don't want a proverb either. I'm not looking for a psalm. I'm not looking for a proverb. What are you looking for? I'm looking for Isaiah. I want Isaiah. And it's like, what about Jeremiah? I can't find Isaiah. No, I want Isaiah. Take a little bit longer. Take a bit of background music. And it's like, and it's like he's like, you got that Isaiah? No, no, I got Jeremiah. Uh, what about, what about, what about, what about, no, no. I, I, want, I want Isaiah. And it's like, okay. So finally they bring out the book of Isaiah. And he, and he starts looking through the scroll. Because how many of you know there was no numbers back then as far it's like and he's looking for the part that he wants and he finally gets there and he says all right all right all right here we are here we are everybody's like oh good all right what are you going to say now all right this is what he says as the worship team come they're like as the worship team come gee you're quick no because we're going to do something in a minute it's going to help us it's going to help us Isaiah 61 reading from verse 1 listen to this this is Jesus speaking the Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison, the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Some translations say, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and everybody said, Amen and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, which is the church, essentially, to give them, to give them, to give them. I, I love the fact that when the Lord came, he, he came to give, that, that He might release from heaven. He's come to give us gifts. What does He want to give? He wants to give them beauty for ashes. He wants there to be a beautiful exchange of your pain and your heartache and your grief and your tragedy. And those things that you have had no control over, He wants to come into your life and exchange beauty for ashes. He wants to bring and to give the oil of joy for mourning. The oil of joy. I don't know about you, I, I can't help but smile when I begin to talk about the joy of the Lord. And it's like, it's like if we only knew, if we only understand how far Jesus would go to pour out His joy upon us, to pour out His joy upon us. Whenever I think of this scripture, I'm reminded of the anointing that comes upon Aaron, comes down his hair and through his beard and on his cloak and all the way to the edge of the robe. So it's those things that you can remember and maybe can't remember, those things that seem a long way away, but in reality are so close. God wants to pour His joy onto them. He wants to anoint you. He wants to bring an anointing that's so powerful in your life. He wants to give you the oil of joy for mourning. And now here we go. And then... He wants to give us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He wants to give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The 
they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. When I think about this garment of praise, I was at a, at a conference, C3 conference. There's a pastor in America here called Pastor Chris Hodges. I don't know if you know Chris. Yeah, he's a, he's a great preacher, great teacher, great church builder. Well, about eight or nine years ago, he was in Australia. Long story short, he nearly died on the side of the road. I'm driving from Melbourne to, we went and played golf in the afternoon and I was taking him to Geelong that he would preach at a state conference. As we're driving down the road, I go, I, I, I'm just driving along and I've got a bit of doof doof, not real loud doof doof because Chris not a doof doof guy. But I'm driving along, a bit of doof doof, you know, in Australia we're on the right side of the car, you guys are on the wrong side of the car. You'd be surprised how many times George and I walk up to our car and hop into the passenger seat and think, there's a steering wheel over there. Got to go. Very embarrassing. But anyway, I'm driving down the road. I've got my hand on the console. I'm on the console. And out of nowhere, he just grabs hold of my arm, says, pull over, pull over. I'm having a heart attack. And I'm like, far out. You're our guest speaker. Don't die on me. So I pull up as quickly as I can, literally before the car has stopped. The door flies open. Chris falls out onto the ground. He's rolling around the dirt, holding his chest. How many of you know this is not a good start of the conference? Not good, not good. And so, so, long story short, obviously he didn't die because I saw him at the conference nine years later. It was a wild night, wild scenario. And he's very grateful and thankful. It's a long story, but whatever. But here's the thing. He was speaking to me at conference and he was saying, Shane, I was talking to our pastors recently about the spirit of heaviness. And when he said that, in that moment, I realized what I've been battling. It wasn't just the weight of ministry wasn't just the weight of being a father and a husband and a dad who's trying to be a good dad and a good husband. It wasn't a weight of just pastoring and leading and I lead other things in Australia. It wasn't just the weight of that. It was actually a spirit of heaviness that was trying to land on me, suffocate the joy out of me. Like one of those big ugly snakes that was, that's what was really going on. In that moment, I realized, all right, so this is a spirit of heaviness. I know how to combat this. I remember what this, as soon as he said it, I knew what to do. I knew to put on the garment of praise. How many of you know, I don't know about you, I don't wake up with a garment of praise on. Some people wake up, praise the Lord. I'm like, Wah. you know, I'm like a hairy old dog, you know what I'm saying? George has to give me a few kicks to get me out of bed. And then I typically will fall out of bed. I walk into my ensuite. I look into the mirror and see my father looking at me. That's what happens. And as I morning owl, and then I get myself into the shower. And as soon as the water's coming, it's like, it's hard to wake up. And it's in that moment, I can begin to praise God. I don't wake up with a garment of praise on. Some days, if I can be really honest, I can... I was, I was probably in the, I was just doing, 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 doing. I, I forgot where my help comes from. I forgot where I need to go first, which is to that place of praise and put on my garment of praise, that the joy of the Lord might be my strength as I step out into the day. And then I find myself going to battle, going to war, and I don't have my garment on. I, I don't have my praise on. Rather, I'm just looking through natural eyes and, and it's just... But then I realized in that moment, it's like, I, need, I know what I need to do. I need to wake up in the morning and I need to make a decision to put on my praise, to put on my garment of praise. You know, Psalm 42 verse 11 says, why am I discouraged? Because that's where I got to, right there. Why am I discouraged? Why so sad, Shaney boy? Like, look at your life. It's awesome. Why am I so sad? Why am I discouraged? I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again. I, I like that. I will praise Him again. So He knew what He had to go back to. I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. I will praise Him again, and I'll praise Him again, and I'll praise Him. And it's like, my heavens might be falling in. Yeah, you can give God praise if you like. My heavens might be falling in. My situations might be upside down. 
and I can't do a thing, but you know what I can do? I can praise the Lord. And all of, uh, it might seem like everything is coming against me, but I can praise the Lord. It might seem like physically I've got so many challenges, but I can still praise the Lord. It may seem that I've got challenges in my family or in my business or in my whatever, my emotions, but I can make a decision tonight. I am going to praise the Lord. I'm going to praise my way out of this situation. So what do I need to do? I need to put on my garment of praise. I need to put on my garment of praise. I, I, I can promise you this. I had a revelation when Pastor Chris said that. I'm like, I know what to do. And I started praising the Lord. I can promise you from that day till this day, which we're now probably talking three or more months, that's, that thing has not been on me at all. As I, I can be in meetings. I'm laughing. I'm being ridiculous all over again. That's what, that's what they love about me. It's like fun monkey is back. My team tell me I'm at my best when I'm at my best. What do they mean by that? They, they, they like enjoy church. They like the enjoyer. I, I, that's what I need to be for them. That's what I need to be for my wife and for my children. I need to be at my best. I'll be at my best when I'm in my strength. I'll be in my strength when I bring God praise. When my praise goes up, the oil comes down. When the praise goes up, the oil comes down. And it's in that place that the shackles break. We heard about it already tonight. It's in that place the shackles will break off and you'll get free. You'll get breath back in your lungs and you'll be able to go again. I'm going to ask you all to stand if we can. This is what we're going to do. We're going to very simply and very quickly. I want to pray for two groups of people. Actually, I want to pray for two groups of people. But the first group is for the people in this room tonight who may not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want to pray for you first because if you've come in feeling like you're suffocating, you need Jesus. If you've come in feeling like you're without hope, you need Jesus. We all need Jesus. So I want to pray for the people in the room first who need Jesus. And then you're going to be in a position where you can praise the Lord. Because if you don't know the Lord, how can you praise the Lord? But after you've been introduced to Him, then you can put on your garment of praise. And as you lift up the praise tonight, I tell you the truth, the oil of joy is going to come into your life. Yeah. Now, so I want to pray for those who need Jesus, but then we're going to pray for those who just need to put their garment of praise on and make a decision that I, I'm going to praise my way out of this cave. I'm going to praise my way out of this cell. I'm going to praise my way out of this valley. Praise God. So I know South Hill, I know you're on your feet as well. So we're going to pray together. I want to pray for every man, every woman that's in this room tonight who needs to make a decision to give your life to Christ. The Bible teaches us really simple. I love the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the good news. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages for that's the all there, all have sinned. That's all of us. It's not like we're pointing fingers at anyone because there's more coming back at me. But as I, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages for that sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can give your life to Christ, become a child of God, have your sins forgiven, have joy peace, love, fill your heart in an instant and become a child of God and know as you leave this place that you're His and He's yours. As I, it's the most amazing thing. 32 years ago, wheeled into a hospital, out of my brain. I've got to tell you, the next day when, they, when I walked out, I walked out a Jesus freak. Yeah. One encounter with God will change the rest of your life. Change the rest of your life. So I'm going to ask both here and South Hill, maybe you're online, watching online. You can do this there as well. Friends, I want to encourage you today. Let's all close our eyes, bow our heads. We stand in the presence of God. Friends, if you're here tonight and you're saying, Shane, I, I, I've come tonight. I don't know Jesus as my Lord. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. But tonight is a night I want to give my life to Christ. Tonight is a night I know I need to give my life to Christ. Whether you be watching online, whether you be in South Hill, whether you be in, in our downtown location, Friends, can I encourage you, if you're here tonight and you know that you need to give your life to Jesus, make the step. Be bold. Be courageous. I know you don't know the end from the beginning, but the Lord does. And you give your life to Christ. He'll take you on the most incredible journey in Him. So if you're here, if you're there, watching online in South Hill, that's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're here and you're saying, Shane, I want to give my life to Christ. On the count of three now, I want you to raise your hand to the Lord. When you raise it up, don't lift it up a little bit. Lift it all the way up. When I see it go all the way up, I'll point at you and say, God bless you. The moment I say, God bless you, the Spirit of the living God is going to come upon you. It's really that simple. Tonight's tonight. Give your life to Jesus. If you know you need to, 
give your life to Jesus. Maybe some of you need to come back to Jesus. Maybe you've drifted away. Make a decision tonight. I'm coming back to Jesus. It starts again tonight. Here we go, my friends. If you're here, first time or second time, you're saying, Shane, tonight's tonight. I want to give my life to Christ on the count of three. Won't you raise your hand now? Here we go. On the count of three, just shoot that hand all the way up. Here we go. One, two, three. Right now, wherever you are, wherever you are, saying, I want to give my life to Christ. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. Anybody else tonight? Anybody else? Good job. 